I have received notice from the Minister for Finance that he wishes to make a statement. Before I call the Minister, I remind members that in light of social distancing being observed by parties, the Speaker's ruling that members must be in the Chamber to hear a statement if they wish to ask a question has been relaxed. Members do still have to make sure that their name is on the speaking list if they wish to ask a question or to be called, but they can do this by rising in their place as well as by notifying the business office or the table here directly. I would again remind members, yes, I've been away, but I'll return to an old troop. I would remind members to be concise in asking their question. This isn't an opportunity for debate, and long introductions to questions will not be allowed. I call the Minister for Finance, Mr. Conor Murphy. Conor and I join with the Chair of Finance and welcome you back. It's good to see you back in the chair. Uh, the monitoring round is usually the method by which departments can return underspends for their reallocation, identify pressures and manage their budgets. The first monitoring round of 2021 has taken on a new significance as the executive responds to the evolving COVID-19 situation. Before turning to the current year, I want to update the Assembly on the 2019-20 provisional outturn position. Provisional outturn position provides an indication of departmental budget management during the last financial year and also determines the amount of funding the executive can carry forward. The end of the financial year 2019-20 saw the emergence of COVID-19. Excluding the pressures introduced as part of the COVID-19 response, underspends of 25 million resource Dell and 103.1 million capital Dell have been reported by departments. Members will note that in resource Dell, an overspend has been reported by the Department of Education, and while significantly less than reported last year, my officials continue to raise concerns with their education counterparts. The Department for Infrastructure reported an overspend due to a shortfall of income as a, a result of COVID-19 and increased expenditure in PPE. In Capitaldale, the underspend reported is comprised of 102.9 million conventional and 0.2 million financial transactions capital. The most significant capital underspend is reported by the Department of Health. 48.1 million of that relates to the Encompass Digital Investment Project. The contract for this large-scale digital investment programme was due to be signed in 2019-20. However, the Department carried out additional due diligence, delaying the contract signing to 2021. The Department for Communities also reported a significant underspend of $24 million, which relates to the new build housing programme. This underspend, along with many other elements of underspend reported by departments, is due to the impact of COVID-19 on capital programmes, with interrupted supply chains, site closures and planning or legal delays. The devolved administrations can access a limited amount of previous year's underspend through the Treasury's Budget Exchange Scheme. The underspend the executive can access in the following year is calculated at block level, meaning changes in regional rates, income and RRI interest payments compared to the level forecast must also be taken into account. Taken together, the total carry forward in resource Dell is $28.4 million. In conventional capital Dell, while the total underspend is $101.6 million, the limit on the amount I can now plan to carry forward is $21.2 million. I am in discussion with the Treasury on additional flexibility that can be applied to this exceptional level of underspend related to the impact of COVID-19. Moving on to ring-fenced financial transactions capital, members will recall that we finished last year with $91.8 million unallocated. Adding to the small departmental underspend of $0.2 million, that figure results in a total underspend of $92 million. The Budget Exchange Scheme provides the potential to carry forward £20 million of the underspend to the 2021 financial year, meaning that £72 million will not be used. Work is ongoing with departments and the Strategic Investment Board to identify the barriers that currently prevent the Executive from fully utilising the financial transaction capital funding available. Pre-Blaskin-Corda, turning to the current year, the challenge of responding to COVID-19 has meant that the June monitoring round has operated differently than in previous years. One fact does remain is that we face significant pressures with limited fundable funding available to address them. The top line figures are that 139.9 million resource Dell and 66.4 million capital Dell and 200.1 million financial transactions capital Dell are available to address both the more routine pressures and those arising as a result of COVID-19. I want to provide some details of the available funding in addition to the budget exchange amounts already mentioned. Since I announced the budget in 2021 outcome this chair, in this chamber, Barnet consequences due to the executive for non-COVID-19 measures have been increased by 3.4 million resource Dell and 6.4 million capital Dell and 0.2 million for FTC. 
Since the announcement of COVID-19 support measures on the 19th of May, additional funding has been available by the Treasury for COVID-19 measures, totalling £190.8 million and £3.1 million capital Dale. Adjustments to forecast the regional rate income and RRI interest requirements has resulted in a £10.8 million resource Dale becoming available for allocation. The Treasury has now confirmed that funding for confidence supply uh, will be available in 2021, and as a result, 15, point, 15 million capital Dale funding I set aside in the budget is now available for allocation. I will continue to seek a commitment to the outstanding 195 million in confidence and supply funding. Changes to a number of central items have had a minor impact on the funding available, in reducing the resource Dale by 0.1 million and capital Dale by 5.1 million. Moving on to reduced requirements, these come to 2.9 million resource Dale, largely due to COVID-19 delay in the recruitment of staff, and 33.5 million capital Dale. Adjusting the capital Dale for the Irish Government contribution to the F5 means that 25.8 million capital Dale is available for reallocation. Full details are included in the tables provided with this statement. Members will recall that in May I announced a significant package of COVID-19 response measures and as a result over one billion of resource Dell has been allocated to departments. These allocations included four million for substitute teachers. DE have reported that uptake for this initiative has been less than anticipated and can be managed from within its existing budget. DE have therefore returned the four million resource Dell for reallocation. Department of Justice also returned 0.75 million of the 1.6 million allocated for the temporary resting place. When I announced the package of business rate support measures in the executive's COVID-19 response, I highlighted that the cost exceeded the funding available. In this monitoring round, I am addressing that issue by providing additional 97.7 million required to address that shortfall, as well as the latest cost assessment of that support. Mr. Speaker, before I turn to the allocations I am making today, I want to update members on the COVID-19 reprioritisation exercise that has now been completed by all departments. In response to the challenges of this pandemic, departments have been able to reprioritise over £140 million of existing budgets to address COVID-19 pressures. I will keep this position under review and encourage departments to continue to find ways of addressing their internal pressures. When I announced the Executive's response to COVID-19 in May, I provided members with an update on how the Executive is using £95 million set aside to support the transport sector. Alongside support for ferry operators and airports, I allocated £30 million to the Department for Infrastructure for loss of income and particular pressures within TransLink. From the remaining funding set aside, I am now allocating a further £30 million to the Department for Infrastructure to offset lost income. £20 million of this is for a second allocation to TransLink, with the remaining £10 million to replace lost incomes across the transport sector. Last week, the Executive agreed to further support our three airports, and to that end, we will ask the Department for Transport and Treasury to address the costs of air passenger duty and safety and security activities. We will also want to continue the support to the City of Derry Airport up until March 2021. Allocations of ring fence financial transactions capital totaling £35 million have been made to the Department for the Economy. In this round, £20 million will provide support to potential start-ups and continued investment in our tourist attractions, and the other £15 million is for schemes agreed at the time of the budget. Using financial transactions capital it remains a challenge, but I would encourage all departments to seek ways of using this funding. I will now deal with the allocation of the 139.9 million resource Dell and the 63.7 million capital Dell. In pre last concord, it will come as no surprise that the majority of resource Dell allocations go towards helping combat the impact of the COVID-19 crisis. I have allocated 22.7 million to the Department for Communities. This provides 5 million to help process the increase in Social Security recipients, 4.5 million for a community support fund, 4 million for the cultural sector. 3.7 million for the homeless, 3.5 million to purchase PPEs for staff who work on the Supporting People programme, and 2 million for sport. The Department for the Economy receives 4.7 million to support higher education, invest NI marketing, and grants to small and medium enterprises. The Department of Education receives 39 million to fund free school meals over the summer months for an increased child provision from the 1st of July, and for summer activities supporting children and learning. The Health Service has been at the, forf- at the front line of the COVID crisis and providing a further £51.4 million to the Department of Health. This will provide not only for the continued response to COVID-19, but also service transformation for elective care and the mental health plan. On top of the £30 million for transport-related pressures, I have also allocated £5.5 million to the Department for Infrastructure for lost income to NIW. 
I have allocated £13.5 million to the Department of Justice for increased costs for the prison service, PSNI and PPE and lost income in the court service. The Executive Office has incurred the cost of work with the press throughout the ongoing COVID-19 response, and I am allocating half a million pounds to the Executive Office for this purpose. In addition, I am allocating £2.5 million to the Executive Office for administrative costs in relation to victims' payments. In line with the Treasury's statement of funding policy, which makes clear that the Department which makes policy will bear the cost of that policy, the NIO is responsible for funding this scheme. Turning to Capitaldale, I am allocating £38.7 million to the Department of Health for the purchase of essential equipment and for Invest to Save projects. The Department of the Economy will receive £25 million to provide grant funding for the University of Ulster Belfast campus. This will replace £25 million of the planned financial transactions capital loan. Departments need to respond as dynamically as possible to the fluctuating financial position. I am therefore extending the flexibility that the departments have had this, in this round to reallocate internal budgets until the October round. All funding currently available has now been allocated. These allocations help our public services, including the health service, they assist in economic recovery and they protect the most vulnerable in our society, including children entitled to free school meals and the homeless. Pre Corda, I commend the June monitoring outcome to the Assembly. Thank you, Minister. Before I call uh, the Chair of the Economy Committee to speak, I would remind members that I have 19 Assembly members on my list seeking to ask a question, and one hour is allocated after a ministerial statement. So if you do the maths, you realise we need to be short, sharp and focused. I call the Chair of the Economy Committee, Dr Steve Aiken. Uh, I think Aquiva looks much better than I look, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, but as Chair of the Finance Committee, thank you very much indeed. And I will be addressing these comments as a member of the Ulster Unionist Party Finance Spokesperson, because the Finance Committee will be taking detailed uh, evidence on this June monitoring round within our committee over the forthcoming weeks. So thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, and I may also thank the Finance Minister uh, for meeting me earlier today. And thank you very much indeed for at last getting the much-delayed June monitoring round uh, through to us. I wish to highlight some of the issues that have been become apparent and are worthy of consideration of this Assembly. We welcome that with the, with the addition of an additional $1.3 billion from our National Exchequer, that we have managed to achieve an underspend of $25 million in resource Dell and $133 million in respect of capital Dell, a total of $128 million. And that you will have mentioned the top line figures of $140 million in resource Dell and $66 million in capital and $200 million in financial transaction capital, which I will refer to later. This, coupled with the existing COVID recovery and support mechanisms... Dr Aiken, I, I know there's a question just struggling to get out. <laughs> Help it out. What's the question? I know there is indeed, Mr Speaker. But uh, uh, you, normally, you normally give the Chair of the Finance Committee a degree of latitude to respond. <laughs> I, will then, I will then ask one particular question to the Minister of Finance. This is the question that we've all been waiting for. We are now at a situation where we have now come to close on three and a half months on, and we have still not heard of a fiscal council being set up. We have still not heard of the appropriateness of looking at proper management, and we still have not heard about what we are going to do to ensure that all committees in this House are giving appropriate financial information on time. I think that is indeed is a question, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. That probably deserves the added extra minute to speak, but thank you. Minister. Well, I'm not sure it's the one we've all been waiting on, but anyway, uh, no, point, no point in not billing your question appropriately. Uh, can I say that the, the, the member will understand that the executive agreed but as, as we moved into response to pandemic and the emergency that we were in to suspend normal business and to focus all of our energy in relation to that. It's only in the last number of weeks that the executive has now, and departments have now started to turn their attention back to things like NDNA commitments uh, uh, and to a range of other measures which uh, were priorities for all of the departments and the executive collectively in the few weeks that we had before the pandemic hit. Uh, and so we're turning our mind back to that. So the, the idea that the Fiscal Council has been sitting for three and a half months with nothing happening is, is inaccurate. Uh, these issues are to be taken forward. They were interrupted for the last three months by the executive's uh, need to collectively face 
the emergency situation that we're facing and to respond appropriately to that. We're now moving, thankfully, out of that, although we're not by any means out of the woods in relation to what might emerge from the COVID-19 experience. Uh, and we were, are turning our mind to all of those issues which had been stacked up. Uh, the issue of, of uh, financial accountability from each department through their committees are, are going to be a matter for all of the committees. Uh, we, we can uh, lead by example, and I hope we do in the Department of Finance, uh, but it will be a matter for committees to hold uh, their, their departments to account. And uh, I will, as I have always undertaken, to come here and give explanations for how the Department for Finance is allocating money. Uh, I expect committees and committee chairs to hold their rel relevant ministers uh, to account in terms of the spending of that money. Mr. Paul Frew. Speaker, and, and I think the fact that we have £128 million of an underspend last year proves some way that these monitoring rounds are very important going forward so we don't end up in a situation next year if something was to happen further. Uh, straight on to my question, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, at a time when we should be investing in skills and work for those skills in any recovery, why has the Minister refused bids from the Department of Economy and the Department of Infrastructure around bids? And with regards to the overcommitment, the Minister had stated, I think, 100 million was the current overcommitment in this year's financial budget. Uh, can he give an update to this House about an overcommitment as it presently stands? Well, as I said, we, we, the, the figures for overcommitment were included in my statement. Uh, his issue around underspend is, is correct. We don't want to see underspend. Uh, it means that that money we otherwise would have spent on services here is returned uh, to the Treasury, and that's never a good situation. Uh, you obviously have had three years without uh, uh, an assembly to hold departments to account and ministers to take decisions, which they are held accountable for. Uh, and we were moving into a scenario there where we expect that to be improved. We have the issue of the pandemic and all of the spending plans been turned on their head over the first quarter of this year. So there will no doubt be a challenge in terms of underspend at the end of the year. And we continue to engage with the Treasury to try and uh, get the necessary flexibilities to deal with however our budgets end up uh, as the year moves on. Uh, the bids from uh, in relation to skills, uh, I mean, they, they, just to remind them that it's actually the executive which approves the bids. I make a recommendation to them. The executive decides, uh, and the Department of Economy has the flexibility because other matters have been uh, supported in terms of bids. If they wish to reprioritise within the economy itself, then they have that ability to reprioritise and meet things which they consider to be more pressing need or more of a priority. Mr. Declan McAleer. I'm going to ask Ken Corlea. Um, my question was in relating to the uh, £25 million um, agri-food intervention scheme that was announced, uh, which the, the dear minister has announced. But since the statement, since the minister has started making a statement here today, the dear minister has issued a, a written statement as to how that should be allocated. But I suppose to, uh, we'll, we'll ask the finance minister when he's here, as it has his department been in, um, his officials been in contact with the dear officials in relation to a business case for uh, the allocating of this £25 million agri-food uh, market intervention scheme. Yes, the, the, the department continues to engage with all departments in, in terms of both uh, assessing what bids they have made and, and ensuring uh, that it's spent in appropriate fashion. So we, we do continue to engage uh, with the department. There will be further bids made in relation to market interventions, I have no doubt, from the Department for Agriculture in the time ahead, because uh, like all sectors, they will continue to struggle. Uh, and we have to continuously reassess what the requirements are. But uh, the, the executive has to try and prioritise where it sees uh, finances needed most immediately and allocate the funds accordingly. But uh, we will continue to engage through my officials with all of the departments, including DERA, in relation to what they, they feel their pressures are, what they feel the urgent uh, situations are within their sectors, uh, and how we might, might, might best meet those. Mr. Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank the Finance Minister for bringing this to the Assembly. Um, today, albeit, as others have said, some of it was um, brought to uh, certain other media outlets beforehand. Um, would the Finance Minister agree with me that in Northern Ireland we face two long-term problems, crises even? One, we are the most underinvested, unproductive part of the UK or Ireland. Two, our government has a long-term structural challenge at getting capital spending out the door. Those two challenges are related. As we have seen today, we have hundreds of millions of pounds of capital underspend. And I'm afraid 
Today's monitoring round remains another missed opportunity in terms of setting long-term priorities for investment. Would he agree with me that later this summer and through the October monitoring round, his priority and the priority of the executive should be setting long-term economic goals and ensuring that we have the proper capital spending to both emerge from the COVID crisis and also to finally get our economy working properly for our people? Well, I don't disagree with the member in terms of uh, his assessment on, on some of the challenges we face and when, when people ask me to welcome spending that has happened. Uh, there, there's no doubt the backdrop to that is we, there's been a long-term underinvestment here as well. So we, we do welcome any additional assistance, but we're not blind to the situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, and yes, of course, capital spend and, and bringing forward capital spend in a timely manner and ensuring it's going to be the most challenged aspect of our public spending this year because we've lost the first quarter in terms of that, and construction is only beginning to kind of ratchet up and get back into a position where it can be fully active again. Uh, and, and undoubtedly, supply chains will continue to be affected uh, by the COVID crisis across the world. So that's going to be a significant challenge. Uh, I've already asked departments a, a number of months back to bring forward uh, uh, capital programmes to make sure that those uh, which may be ready to go are brought to that position of readiness, that they're not sitting back and then starting to go through assessments and uh, business cases and things like that, that they, they bring those schemes ready to go. We've been engaging on a very regular basis with the construction sector because uh, well, my department has a responsibility for that engagement with, uh, with that sector uh, to make sure that we understand where, where they are in terms of their readiness to come back. Uh, the type of works that they can engage in. Uh, and, and all of that is geared towards ensuring that we can spend as best we can the capitals available, because that is uh, going to be one of the key areas for, for uh, reinvigorating the economy, uh, is capital spend and ensuring people are working. Uh, and, and it's also going to be a key area and challenge in terms of making sure that we can get that money spent. And that's why, as well as trying to do all of that, which is necessary, we do have the uh, discussions ongoing with the Treasury to try and ensure we have flexibility at the end of the year, recognising that it's going to be a challenge. The Executive is having a broader discussion in relation to economic recovery, and I think issues like this, it's not just simply about what money you get and where you can allocate it, it's about how the system of government works to assist doing things better and to get more value out of the spend that we have and to make sure that that contributes to growing the economy. Mr Andrew Muir. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, as other members have outlined, there has been significant underspend in capital monies. Um, financial transaction capital monies have been uh, proven difficult to spend. We haven't been able to utilise our borrowing powers to utilise uh, capital um, investment. And the overall focus of that is to safeguard and create jobs. As part of those ongoing discussions within the executive, will the minister give real serious consideration whether we should have an infrastructure commission or panel to drive delivery, to safeguard those jobs and to do job creation like other parts of the UK already have? Well, I think we can look at uh, any and all measures. We have the Strategic Investment Board uh, already there to, to assist in terms of, of, of projects, uh, big projects like that, to give advice to departments. Uh, and clearly, we want to get that uh, capital money spent. There was uh, 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 underutilisation of finance and transaction capital last year. As I say, one of the issues uh, was the, the, the loss of legislation in relation to the uh, housing sector. Uh, and that, I understand that legislation is completing or perhaps in its final stages this afternoon. Uh, so I, I hope that that will bring about an improvement in terms of accessing that FTC. And of course, I agree with them. We do need to do that. We need to access it better. We need to spend it better. We need to ensure that it's used for the benefit of growing the economy. Uh, and these measures are there for us. There are other resources for us. When you look at Peace Plus, when you look at International Fund, when you look at the Investment Fund that we have, the executive needs a collective overview in relation to all of these resources and then try and ensure that they are used in a way to support the priorities that the executive sets itself in terms of economic recovery. Mr Paul Given. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, can I welcome the inclusion in the statement of the £2.5 million um, for administration cost in relation to victims' uh, payments? Uh, can I ask the, the Finance Minister um, that he will now engage with the Treasury to ensure that the funding of this scheme is delivered? Uh, and furthermore, uh, will he also assist in ensuring that the Department of Justice is the designated department and that any hurdles being created around capacity, support from the wider civil service uh, will be overcome and that his party is now fully supportive of this scheme being fully implemented and the victims receiving the payment they deserve? Well, can I say the, uh, the, he's, he's quite correct in that it is the Treasury's res uh, responsibility to fund this scheme. Uh, under their own uh, fund and payment proce process that they have, uh, the department which 
uh, devises the scheme, which legislates for the scheme, is responsible for the delivery of it and responsible for the finances uh, to deliver that. Uh, and so, uh, as of yet, we haven't even got an assessment from the NIO or the Treasury as to what the cost of the scheme might be while they try to offload the responsibility for it. The member will be very much aware that the scheme uh, and the, the processes which the, all the parties came to an agreement in Stormont House a number of years back uh, is not replicated in the, the victim's pension scheme that has been uh, delivered to us by the British government. Uh, clearly departs from the agreement that the five parties and both governments uh, came to. So in that regard, it's a different scheme altogether. Um, we don't have any, indeed any cost for it, uh, no estimation of a cost for it. So those are issues uh, which I think we have to continue collectively as an executive to fight uh, with uh, the, the government and the Treasury in relation to. The money that I have allocated for is to get the administrative side set up. It does not uh, lend itself to uh, the, the matter of which department might be responsible for it is a matter for the Executive Office in the first instance to make a call on. So this is simply about providing that resource to get the, if you like, the mechanics done in relation to setting up uh, uh, the, 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 the facilities needed to deliver such a scheme. The decisions then have to be taken around how does it work and who funds it and what department leads it. Those are all decisions for the future. Mr. Moore, Lisa McHugh. Mr. Uh, uh, I just uh, thank you for your statement as well, too. Um, uh, and in many respects, it isn't uh, surprising that it is health and uh, education that it takes a good part of uh, the budget. Uh, and I appreciate, too, the fact of that continuing support not to the city of Derry Airport and my own area that where we know it's important for connectivity. But another element of connectivity that concerns me as well too is for young people and whether business has been made to the department in terms of internet connectivity to the rural community uh, where it's going to be so vital now uh, in the future uh, in terms of distance learning and the likes of it. Well, I mean, I, I, I pleased that we've managed to, to deliver so much funding across a, a variety of departments and of course uh, connectivity is, is vitally important and, and that's he's mentioned the, uh, the airports, the, all of the airports uh, have a huge role in terms of our connectivity but that's not just being able to connect people uh, to places, it's been able to connect economies as well uh, and that's a huge role and, and of course the confidence supply money uh, that we did manage to secure which uh, again it, it probably following on from our last discussion in relation to uh, funding that was to be made available to the British government, and we also include that the anti and funding. Uh, some of that is to be put into connectivity, particularly in the rural areas through the broadband uh, connection, seeing the project stratum. So, uh, while we were uh, prepared to look at, at supporting the Department of Economy, in that nonetheless we did not give up on the struggle to get that money that had been committed uh, through the British government, and we have been able uh, to do that. And the, the scheme, I hope, will, will roll out as quickly as possible. Connectivity is, uh, is going to continue to be a challenge, both in terms of our airports and our roads, our rail network work, but particularly in terms of broadband. And we've seen, I suppose, the experience over the, over the, the course of the last three months is that, it, that uh, uh, broadband connectivity is more vital than, other, than ever in terms of connection, not just for families, but for businesses, for the ability of people to work from home, the ability of people to, uh, to have a more flexible work arrangement. So it's going to be hugely important, and the sooner we get all of those connectivity issues addressed, then the better for us. Mr. Jonathan Buckley. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, while I welcome the broad allocation, I want to direct my question towards the further financial allocations for TransLink. Surely the Minister will share my deep concerns regarding the management and oversight of TransLink throughout COVID-19. Firstly, they did not furlough staff, costing the NI Block Grant budget three million a month. And secondly, they ran trains with supposedly only four passengers on board at a cost of £4,000 per journey. Bad behaviour and mismanagement seems to have murdered further budget allocations. Surely this deserves further scrutiny. Well, I think the, the, I mean, the, the public transport network is, is vitally important to us. And if, if we are to talk about uh, returning to economic activity, uh, public transportation is a key part of that. Return to schools, public transportation is a key part of that. So we do need a well-functioning, a properly functioning public transportation system. It needs to be resourced by the executive. They rarely pay for themselves. They always will need that subsidy from the executive. Uh, and they need to connect some of the, those rural areas that we're telling about, which would be very much unprofitable routes for them. All that said, there needs to be, we, we need to make sure that we're, we're doing that in a way which is, stands up to scrutiny. Uh, and clearly there have been concerns expressed about the cost, ongoing costs in terms of TransLink uh, to the executive. Uh, I've asked the infrastructure minister to bring a paper in relation to 
uh, TransLink to the executive so we can have a discussion and a look uh, behind the scenes and see uh, how we can improve that because uh, I think effectively the cost is about £10 million pounds a month uh, to the executive to keep uh, that company afloat. And while the executive has expressed a very firm view that we want to keep a public transportation system working and it is vital to all those areas of recovery and society, then we need to make sure that we have one that is functioning to its most efficient. Uh, and I've asked the uh, Infrastructure Minister to bring us back a discussion paper in relation to that. Mr. Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and welcome back. We wish you a speedy recovery. Uh, I wish to ask the Minister to welcome the fact that the Minister is looking into the barriers in the allocation of the uh, FTC. However, I have no question how long this has been looked at uh, by different finance ministers, and I hope you are the Minister that can deliver this. The allocation has been an issue of this Assembly for a long time, and 92 million. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, on spent. There's a lot of money that uh, we haven't spent. I want to ask the Minister in his speech, I've seen there was no help for single person businesses and sole traders. Uh, these businesses now receive no COVID support, and it's been indicated to me that the monitoring round could address this gap. I've already asked the question about the help with VAT, and that's going forward. Will the Minister keep these? Uh, business in his mind uh, as, as we go forward because they are crying out for help, as I've said there earlier, and any help or any support, taking in mind that it is the backbone of our small, rural and urban Northern Ireland economy. Thanks, Minister. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I mean, I had outlined in relation to the FTC that one of the issues uh, last year in terms of the, the significant amount that was returned was that the the necessary legislation wasn't done uh, for housing sector. That's hopefully near in completion now. However, we now face the challenge of having lost the first quarter uh, in terms of construction and activity, which would normally utilise capital budgets, uh, has been effectively uh, brought to a halt for, for a quarter of the year at least, and, and perhaps uh, only you know, gradually reopening again over the next quarter. So that's going to be a challenge. Uh, nonetheless, we have. Uh, are talking to all of the departments about how they access FTC. We, I, I think, are putting the additional support or advice available to people from the Strategic Investment Board uh, because we do want to utilise this. It is available to us, uh, and we want departments to be able to spend that. But we know it's an important part of trying to assist economic recovery. Uh, in relation to the supports, yes, the, we haven't allocated the. Uh, 53 million that was surrendered by the Department of the Economy as yet, but we have had a discussion on it. We want to try and find ways to support those people who did not get support from the other business support grants. Uh, that that would be more challenging than perhaps the first tranche of money because there are more complex cases, there, uh, there are more uncertainties around them, but I, I think it, we have to try uh, to find arrangements to do that, and we are engaging with those sectors on a regular basis, and I'm sure the Department of the Economy is engaging with them as well. Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. I'm sorry to say I'm, I'm feeling huge caution about welcoming the start-up money for the Victims Payment Scheme, uh, or pension, as it's more commonly known, because I'm not confident Sinn Féin accepts the qualifying criteria. Uh, and I'm sure the House would agree it would be beyond cruel to offer victims hope today and then dash that hope tomorrow. My question Deputy Principal Speaker to the Minister, is this Minister, do you consider yourself a victim? No, I don't. Uh, I, I may have qualified uh, under the terms of it, but I don't personally consider myself a victim. Uh, what the member does know is that we did reach an agreement. I'm not sure if he was part of the Stormont House negotiations at the time. The, the, the mists of time started to cloud my brain at these, these stages. But uh, the five parties reached an agreement. It was a very complex and a complicated and a, a, a challenging agreement. And we, we tried to reach an agreement that, if he remembers back, and I'm sure other members do, is because the toxicity of the legacy issues were impacting the working of this institution. And the parties sat down determinedly to try and agree a range of legacy mechanisms uh, which we could all come to agreement, not what everybody wanted, but which we could all stand over, and both governments stood over that. It was handed over to the British government to legislate for that, and they changed the terms of reference for the victim's pension. And they also decided, rather than them making a contribution or them being responsible for it, that they would hand the cost of that over to the executive, uncosted un under the terms that they have now set for that. But the executive has no idea of what the cost of that is. So, of course, I do want to offer victims some comfort, and I recognise there's been an attempt to play off what is clearly a point of political difference from the departure that the British government has taken us on 
uh, regardless of how the five parties uh, reach an agreement or the Dublin government's involvement in relation to all of that. They have taken us off in their own direction, uh, and they have now tried to play off the fact that we disagree with that with, uh, against those who are most deserving and need very quick access, as I fully understand, to the support that may come from the victim's pension. So the quickest way to resolve this is the British government to come back to the type of process that we agreed. Let's do this thing fairly. Let's get it uh, resourced properly uh, under those who are responsible for resourcing, and let's get it out to victims. Mr. Gary Middleton. Well, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his statement. Uh, 4.7 million was allocated uh, to the Department for Economy. However, uh, our, our, our committee were disappointed uh, when we received the briefing that uh, 2.5 million pounds, which was previously indicated that would come to the Department, uh, was was taken away from it. Um, what message, Minister, does this send, particularly to those uh, involved in skills uh, and how uh, we move forward? Uh, in this uh, difficult economic time? Well, can I say, firstly, the, the monitor round papers agreed by the executive as a whole. Uh, I make propositions the executive can agree or disagree or amend as they see fit. So the decision in relation to the allocation or reallocation of various sums of money is taken by the executive as a whole. Uh, of course, there is flexibility within the Department of Economy if they consider that skills area to be a higher prioritisation than some of the money they've been allocated to re reprioritise that money themselves and meet the skills issue. And of course, I did indicate to the Economy Minister that I'm happy to continue the, the dialogue and discussion with her uh, and with others. And we are coming back to the idea of uh, economic recovery and skills will undoubtedly be an important part in relation to all of that. And the Executive will have further allocations to make uh, in the time ahead. Mr. Colin Gildon, you. Premier Laskian, colleagues, to Falsha Arash. You're very welcome back, Principal Deputy First Speaker. Uh, could I say that I'm appreciative that the health, is, the health Department is receiving a degree of support for which other departments would no doubt be glad. However, 14 million has been allocated of the 69 million estimated for New Dega New Approach commitments and transformation. How does the Executive plan to address that shortfall and the shortfall for storage planning given the financial pressures on the Executive budget? Well, there, there will continue to be pressures on our budget, and uh, while, as I say, the COVID uh, allocations we have got have been very welcome and, and quite clearly were needed to ensure that the health system could cope with the pressures, the additional pressures from the pandemic it was going to face. And nonetheless, I mean, we, we were still dealing with a position before COVID arrived of huge pressures in relation to health, and particularly in relation to transformation. And the, I say the most frustrating aspect of the British government's reneging on its commitment under NDNA was that quite a bit of that was going to be allocated and towards health transformation. Uh, so the executive uh, and, and I have undertaken this job on their behalf are continuing and will continue to pace the British government to live up to honour its responsibilities, honour its commitments that it made under NDNA, which were to assist us in these matters. Uh, if it is the case that they continue to hold out, the executive is going to have to find from its own limited resources money to meet uh, all of those priorities, and that means that other priorities will undoubtedly slip as a consequence. Mr Chris Little. Principal Deputy Speaker, and good to see you back. Um, the Finance Minister expresses concern for the Department of Education overspend in 2019-20. Can I ask the Finance Minister by how much the Education Department overspent, what explanation he received for this overspend, and if he agrees that the Education Minister should lift his suspension of work on the independent review of education as one way to attempt to address this financial crisis in education? Well, I think it's, it's really not for me to prescribe within education as to what they do with, with the, the allocation that they have. Uh, they bring forward uh, the Obviously, they got their budget allocation, which was an increase this year, uh, and then they bring forward bids, uh, and w we would expect that they bring forward uh, reprioritisation, uh, would surrender some money that it, they con consider isn't needed in the time ahead. So, in relation to the overspend last year, it is concerning, and it is uh, reduced, and I think we want to continue to work for the I don't have the detail of exactly where uh, that overspend occurred, but we, we will continue to work with them to try and address that issue, and I, I know the Education Minister is committed to doing that, uh, and, and of course it will be a matter for the Committee, I think, to provide an ongoing scrutiny with the Department in, in that regard. Uh, but clearly we want to assist them in doing that, because while we're trying to manage the spending uh, of the budget, we, we can't allow ourselves to run into overspend situations where those can be avoided. Ms Pam Cameron. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and welcome back to the Chamber. Uh, thank the Minister for his statement and very much welcome the extra monies that have been made available to the Department of Health at this time, uh, a critical time as we emerge from the first wave of COVID-19. I wanted to ask the, the, the Minister, in terms of PPE provision, what uh, role will the Department of Finance play in working towards Northern Ireland being self-sufficient in manufacturing its own PPE supplies? Well, I think that I mean I think one of the lessons from this pandemic is that critical health supplies uh, being procured at the far side of the world because they happen to be cheaper there is a lesson that we have to reevaluate re uh, as to how we do our own procurement. And we have a very strong and efficient uh, and innovative manufacturing base here, uh, and and it clearly showed that when. Uh, sections of that manufacturing have stepped up, reprofiled their manufacturing, and were very quickly able to turn out critical supply for the department. So I have asked, I have actually recently written, I think this week, to the health minister to say when they're looking at future supply, they should not just be simply looking, I know they don't on their own look at price, but I mean, price is one issue. Security of supply, uh, the assistance of the local economy have to be things which come up the, the evaluation list, if you like, in terms of procurement. Uh, and so I think that there is a sector here which is willing to step up. Uh, we won't uh, have the experience of trying to compete with other larger international players on the other side of the world, trying to navigate our way through very complex systems to get very necessary and vital medical supply. And thankfully, we have now secured a supply from China. Uh, I think it, it, it from the health department's own assessment, it will be enough to carry us through uh, the possibility, and we have to plan for the possibility, indeed the probability, of a resurgence of COVID-19, and if that coincides with winter pressures, then that will put significant pressure on healthcare staff. So we are in a position now where that, that if you like, early critical issue in the COVID pandemic outbreak uh, is now in a much better place, uh, and that's been through good work, both the health department, the finance department, and TEO officials uh, in securing that. But that was such a big, big challenge, I think, one of the lessons we have to learn is to how do we have more security of supply and security of supply means that it's made on this island or in these islands uh, and therefore it's much more accessible to us. Ms Karen Mullen. And I also welcome you back. Minister, um, like my party colleague, I welcome the, the funding that's on there for City of Derry Airport, but I particularly welcome the funding to extend free school meal payments over the summer. Minister, do you agree that now we have a mechanism in place that to make such payments, departments should work together to, ta to continue to tackle holiday hunger and food poverty? Yes, well, I, I think there has been, I mean, for, from my witnessing of it, there, there has been, I would suggest, much greater cross-departmental cooperation in terms of response to this pandemic. And it's another one of the lessons that I think need to be carried forward from uh, from the experience of COVID-19. Uh, and clearly, I know that there has been quite a lot of collaboration between the Department of Communities, Department of Education, Department of Health in relation to some of these. The, the earlier scheme in relation to child uh, care support that came out of the Department of Health and education, I think, was not administered satisfactorily, and, and there was quite a lot, a uh, significant amount of underspend that I think it was an unnecessary, complicated scheme. Uh, I hope that the money now given, which is between Department of Health and Department of Education for Childcare, is administered in a much more efficient way that's easy to get out onto the ground where it's needed. But the, the other schemes, I think that there has been uh, collaboration between communities, health, and education at varying times. Uh, I think those schemes are. are are uh, hugely important and, and I think as you correctly point out the issue of holiday hunger isn't just as a consequence of the COVID pandemic it's an ongoing issue and I'd like to see more collaboration with the boards. I think when you do that it makes a much better case to the executive and to through the Department of Finance for the funds and resources necessary for these very worthy schemes. Mr Colin McGrath. Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, and we indeed welcome you back in your role here today and also look forward to seeing you at committee again tomorrow. Um, I thank the Minister too for his comprehensive statement, uh, most of which I read this morning online. And it includes um, 2.5 million uh, for the victim scheme, one that hasn't started, doesn't have a budget, and as we're led to believe, we don't know uh, the full list of who will be entitled to it, never mind it not having a lead department to deliver it. But my question relates to transparency. Um, when was the return made? from the Executive Office to the Department of Finance, because I'm not speaking today as Chair of the Executive Office, because we didn't get that return until last Friday when it was too late for us to be able to give it consideration to come back to you here today. And do you think that that's acceptable, given that we've got a new era of openness and transparency? 
Well, the, 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 the way monitoring around papers are done is that there's an initial paper produced, then there's an ongoing exchange between the departments in relation to that. Uh, I had, uh, for instance, a, a meeting subsequent to that with your own party colleague in relation to her allocation, and uh, some departments uh, write back to us, some departments speak to us, and, and they're either satisfied, not satisfied, or feel that a bid they made it was less important to them than another one that was, was not secured or not recommended to be secured. So that's an ongoing process. Uh, it, it, uh, it comes back eventually to the executive, uh, and the executive have a, an opportunity to have their say in relation to that. Uh, that issue, uh, he will know the issue of the victims' pensions, is, and he'll know particularly through his role, uh, is a very thorny issue. Uh, and while he expresses dissatisfaction with the fact that it has not been moved on, he'll know where the problems have been created in relation to it. Uh, the 2.5 million is to help assist uh, getting the apparatus in place so that when agreement is reached, then the system is ready to go. But he will understand that there are very significant problems that have been presented uh, in relation to the British government's handling uh, of all of this, their attempt to rewrite the agreement that was made in Stormont House, and their attempt to pass on as yet an uncosted bill to the executive for, for our uh, resourcing of that particular issue. Ms. Rachel Woods. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and it is good to see you back in the chair, and I thank the Minister for his statement. The Minister has outlined a number of departmental bids received and accepted and those surrendered. And in light of safety concerns for employees returning to work this week, notably the hospitality sector, some businesses are introducing COVID training. Can I ask the Minister if he or his department, through this June monitoring round, has received any bids from the Department for the Economy to fund this training or other similar training? And if so, does the Department for the Economy intend to spend it? Who is to deliver it? If he any information on that? I, I'm not, I have to say I'm not aware of, of a bid if it was received, uh, and I could certainly ask the, the officials to uh, come back to you in, in relation to, to just to be clear about that. I, I, I don't want to say there was none received, and there may well have been one received, but uh, can I say in relation to tourism and hospitality in particular, uh, recognise very much the difficulty they're facing, and we've always said and recognised that it wasn't just simply a matter of rates relief, which we obviously targeted towards them as one of the principal sectors uh, in rates relief to the end of the year but also it was going to be the cost of re-entering uh, into business, that there was going to be a cost attached to that in terms of training, in terms of whatever physical infrastructure had to be put in place to allow uh, tourism, hospitality, and also retail as well. I mean, I, I did venture out into the retail world in the shopping centre last Saturday, and uh, I, you can see very clearly how people have begun to try and, and make sure their staff are protected and to make sure the systems within shops are operating correctly, which is, is entirely the right thing to do. So part of the 10K and the 20K, 5K support grants were, in were intended to try and allow businesses when they had the rates break, and I know there were other bills that had to be paid, but it was also to allow them to invest uh, in terms of, of restart. Uh, and so I hope that it did go some way towards that. Uh, and the furlough uh, scheme obviously took care of, of, of staff salaries up to 80%, uh, and many businesses did top that up from their own resources to 100% and be, be commended for doing that. Uh, so I'm not certain if there was a bid made in relation to that. It is recognised there's a cost attached to that, but the, the, the primary issues, I suppose, from being on the receiving end of what the tourism and hospitality sector were lobbying about was the date for restarting, uh, where the issues were people couldn't uh, make it work in terms of two metres versus down to uh, one metre at the minimum, uh, and how they would try and operate in those circumstances. And those are the primary things we're hearing from. If there is additional cost to that, I'm very happy to talk to the Department of the Economy if, there, if they see that, identify that as a particular need which is unmet. Mr. Tim Allister. I want to return to the two and a half million pounds which is labelled victims. Is it just window dressing? so long as Sinn Féin maintain their despicable veto blocking innocent victims from receiving a pension. So as long as that continues, can the money, the two and a half uh, million, even be spent? And if it isn't spent, what happens to it? In the terms of the Executive Office, I note they're also getting half a million pounds for press work, something that which isn't in the bids. They didn't ask for it. It's not in the bids on page 24, but it's in the allocations on page 29. What is the half million pounds for, for press work? Can I say in relation to the, uh, the victims' payments, the TEO bid for that to do administrative work and the 
would have to justify the bid in terms of how they intend to spend it. If they, for some reason, decided not to spend it, then it would be re-surrendered back uh, at the next monitoring round. Uh, but the, uh, the Executive Office uh, have a bid in to spend that money in terms of setting up uh, the administrative uh, structure necessary to, to deal with that. It is not simply Sinn Féin that has a disagreement in relation to how the, the victims. The entire executive disagrees with the idea that they pick up the cost as yet uncosted uh, from the British government in relation to that. And I think a substantial number of people outside of Sinn Féin and in other parties have issue with the fact that the British government rewrote the Stormont House Agreement, uh, changed the nature of victims' payments. Uh, and decided to change the criteria in relation to that. That was an agreement that was worked out between five parties and two governments. Uh, if the British government decide, under their own funding policy statement, uh, to bring a different policy forward, to legislate for di something different to which the parties agreed for, then the British government are responsible for that. Members, under Sorry, the... Uh, Mr. Speaker. Oh, yes. Sorry. I had to address the issue of the half a million pound. Uh, and, of course, one of the key issues in terms of, of keeping businesses alive has been the advertising that has come from the executive office in relation to COVID-19. And that has been a lifeline to many small uh, papers, newspapers, and to radio stations. I recently had a discussion with one of the radio stations, and they told us that that effectively had kept the doors open. So it's not simply a matter of spending on spin doctors and uh, putting out statements. It has been, there's been an advertising campaign, which has been a vital lifeline to many of our small and independent media. Thank you, Minister. Under the more loose arrangements that we have because of COVID-19. There's 21 minutes left, and if anyone wishes to ask an additional question of the minister, if they were to rise, if they were to rise in their place, uh, per Robin Swan got this a fortnight ago, if they were to rise in their place, I'll put your name on the list and try and get as many in as possible. Okay, uh, Mr. Nesbitt. Mr. Deputy Speaker, thank you. Uh, could I ask the minister? I think he said there was two million pounds for sport. Can you provide the detail? Unfortunately, I can't here. I don't have the detail. At this, it would be a question for the Department of Communities. I know they had, they had bid for more than the two million. Two million was all we were able to afford them. Four million for the arts, which I think will for resilience in the arts sector. Uh, but I'm sure that that will be welcome. I think it's for resilience in the sports sector. Yes, I'm getting the nod. It's for resilience, so it's to it's to try and keep people keep the doors open. It's not for specific schemes. Uh, but we can get you some detail. Our the communities department, I'm sure, will give you some detail on that. Dr. Kiva Archibald. Welcome, um, privileged and um, I, I too welcome you back. I hope you're feeling better. Um, I thank the minister for the statement, and I, I welcome the allocation to, to business and skills um, in the, the June monitoring round. Obviously, there's an underspend on some of the business support grants, and we hope to see that reallocated to further support for businesses. Um, but looking forward, as, we, as the economy begins to reopen, and the experience that there has been in, in other countries, and obviously in England, um, where Leicester is going into a, a, a lockdown of its own. Um, we may potentially see similar here, and the Minister will know because it was raised in a meeting that we did with hospitality businesses in Causeway Coast and Glens um, on Friday. The concern that there might be that there would be need for specific support for businesses in those areas or some further flexibility around the job retention scheme. And I was wondering if the Minister um, intends to make the case for that with the Treasury. Gurm Elgut. Uh, I, that, uh, the member is correct. That was uh, raised to me at a meeting that, that she attended, uh, and I think it's something that the executive would want to consider. That if we do end up in a specific lockdown in a certain sector, that what do we do in terms of supporting the, the staff? And that that could be not just in the hospitality sector; it could be a factory, it could be a school location. There, the medical discussions and advice that we've been having in the last number of weeks have looked at what uh, future resurgences of COVID might look like, and the experience in some other countries are, is in relation to clusters, uh, and so. So it's not a, a widespread resurgence of the pandemic, but in certain sectors, what would that look down if there is a, a, a more specific geographical or sectoral uh, lockdown? And of course, uh, that, that, uh, so I think those are those are issues that do need considered. Of course, when the the first and deputy Fins, first minister I think announced last week in relation to some of the sectors opening up, it was on the basis of partnership. It's on the basis that the executive have provided what support we can to them, but that everyone has to play their part in actually making sure. That, that the uh, guidance as best as possibly can 
is, is being followed and that they, where it is difficult, to, for instance, to maintain two metres, that people put in uh, whatever mitigating measures they can to make sure because it's not, that, that, that there is no resurgence of the virus. It is particularly in the hospitality and tourism industry's uh, interests to ensure that we don't go back to into even a sectoral lockdown or a geographical lockdown because I think that would have a, a, a very damaging impact on, on the economy generally, but particularly in those sectors. So it is, this is a partnership. It is, it's not just a matter of handing down guidelines, uh, hoping it's in all of the sector's interests and the economy's interests to make sure that we all collectively do as much as we can to continue, to, as we have been doing, and the behaviour has been exemplary by and large, we continue to suppress the virus. Mr Paul Frew. Can I ask the Minister, he talked about, and he's dedicated a page to the transport sector, and we have known before that there is the, the money in the centre held for the transport support, but I do not see anywhere in his statement, and I'm not blaming the Minister because I don't believe it is his problem, where there is no bid yet to support the haulage industry. And I, can I ask the Minister, what's his take on it, and what, why will the Infrastructure Minister not bring forward a bid to support haulage companies at this time? Also, in my previous question, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I asked about the overcommitment uh, currently standing, uh, and the Minister said it was in a statement. I can't find that answer in this, his statement, so I ask again, what is the current overcommitment that this Assembly, or this Executive, have for this current budget year? Thank you. Say in relation to the haulage, there have been a number of sectors, and one of the, one of the things this pandemic has thrown up to us in stark relief is the sheer complexity of all of the sectors we're dealing with, the overlaps, the, the way they fall between departments in terms of somebody has responsibility in terms of regulation, others have responsibility in terms of some economic aspect, and, and, and the, the cross-departmental nature of all of that has been, have been brought very much to the fore. So in relation to whether it's haulage or uh, private coaches or whether it's taxis or various other sectors that uh, airports was another issue that that kind of fell between three departments uh, and Department of Finance took the lead in it with the support from the Department of Economy and Department of Infrastructure. So some of these issues are falling between departmental responsibilities and to be quite honest as a finance minister I'm not overly worried who takes responsibility for them. Two departments jointly or one takes responsibility. Somebody needs to bring forward to us a policy proposal to say, here's the sector, here's the impact is on it, here's what's needed to fix that, and can the executive allocate this support? Here's how it will be distributed among that sector. That's what we need to see, and we haven't seen it yet in a range of, uh, a range of uh, issues. And that's why uh, the pot that we had held aside for transport is shrinking, mm -hmm. uh, because we've made further allocations to TransLink and to the Department for Infrastructure from it as part of this. This, uh, statement in this monitoring round. So that pot is now down to 29.5 million, I think. Uh, and so I, I know there was uh, a discussion at the executive, uh, albeit briefly, as, as we, these are things are challenged when you're operating remotely, uh, but there was a discussion between infrastructure and economy uh, as to getting their heads together on some of these issues. So I look forward to propositions coming. You did ask, uh, and I didn't answer, uh, except there is no over uh, commitment on the budget uh, this year. Uh, the, after every, all the, the allocations, we have 2.7 million capital and 180 million financial. Uh, all of the Dell money is, is resource money is allocated. 2.7 million capital and 180 million financial transaction capital is unallocated. But there's no overcommitment. Because this is his first question, I'm going to call Mr. Roy Beggs. Thank the minister for statement, and in particular, the 20 million is allocated towards TransLink. But this is considerably less than their needs. Would the Minister advise what discussion is he having along with the Infrastructure Minister and TransLink to ensure that the directors can meet their requirements under company law and we can continue to have a public transport service provided in Northern Ireland? Well, I can assure him that I am meeting with the Minister for Infrastructure and this question was asked. I know he was uh, doing his chair duties and out of the room at the time, but the question was asked perhaps from a less supportive uh, position that is more critical of the company itself in terms of the, uh, if, of the ongoing financial requirements of it. And, and uh, I, I was saying I think it's about £10 million a month, which is a significant uh, level of support from the executive. Nonetheless, there is a commitment, as uh, the infrastructure minister knows, to make sure that this company doesn't fail, that a public transportation system is a vital part uh, of society, but of our economy, of connectivity, uh, of getting schools back. Uh, functioning again, uh, and so we want to make it work, but we want to make sure that the company is run, being run in the most efficient way possible, and that it just, just isn't continuously uh, seen, as some members uh, undoubtedly say it, as a cash drain, 
uh, but that we're getting a good value public transportation system which works for us. So I've, asked, I've had discussions with the Infrastructure Minister and as part of this paper I have asked to the Executive of Astor to bring forward a discussion document in relation to that so we have a look uh, at what TransLink's requirements are. You're right, we haven't met them, but we couldn't have met what they have identified as the requirements this year under this allocation. It would have used up more than was available to us just for that one company alone. Mr Jonathan Buckley. No, I withdraw as Principal Mr Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And just briefly to go back to the question of um, uh, the item on press support, can I welcome the fact I've spoken to the Finance Minister about the need to support our local media? Can you just give a little more detail on the intention for that, which is to support crucial local, regional, community media through advertising? If you could get some detail on whether he's looking also at rate support, because it looks like they will have struggled uh, far beyond the initial COVID wave. And there's also um, uh, an allocation in here for culture uh, and resilience. I and others have been talking to our arts sector who have been on their knees. Can you work urgently with the communities uh, minister to ensure that money gets out to our artists who desperately need it? Uh, well, on, on, on the first issue, yes, he, he has raised this the issue of the local media on, on a number of occasions and, and uh, undoubtedly, particularly the small uh, regional papers and those regional radio stations uh, rely very much on commercial advertising. Uh, to keep them afloat and their ability to, I know certainly in, in my own uh, local newspaper, the New York Reporter actually went out of print for a number of, maybe two months uh, before it came back. So that undoubtedly was a huge burden for a small localised paper uh, to deal with. So the advertising revenue from the executive has been very important. And I am actively looking at the issue of rates uh, for them. Uh, there are different sectors, as he knows, there are small, independent, almost family-owned businesses, and there are larger conglomerates, and there are some international players in relation to some of our, our local media here as well. Uh, so we're actively looking at, at that uh, in terms of, of, of giving them support. Uh, of course, in relation to the arts, yes, uh, undoubtedly the arts sector has, has suffered this. Four million is probably not what they would have, uh, as much as they would have wanted to see, but nonetheless we had to try and disperse a limited uh, level of, of resource available just across a range of priority interests. And so I will I'd be happy to talk to the Communities Minister to make sure that's uh, distributed as quickly as it can. Uh, it, it is uh, hugely important to keep the arts uh, functioning and, and undoubtedly they, with the lockdown, have lost the ability to generate income themselves. So we have to recognise that too. Mr Jim Allister. Thank you. I think the figure in respect of free school meal, meals over the summer was around £12 million. Pounds. Is that a precedent now set for previous, for succeeding years, or is that a one-off situation? Well, it's a one-off payment, but I hope the, the idea of the policy that has emerged is a precedent. Uh, I would sincerely hope that. Uh, but that, of course, will be a matter for the departments responsible to bring that forward. Uh, this particular bid was for this summer for a scheme, uh, but I think the issue of holiday hunger has been one which has long been identified uh, and no steps have been taken to address it. So if this pandemic forced us into a situation that was being addressed, then as I sincerely hope, speaking uh, from a political perspective, that that is a precedent and that we do get into looking after those children over the summer as well. Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Finance Minister if he could detail for what the additional £10 million allocated to transport is purposed? I, I think uh, I, the additional £10 million from, from memory is to do with the lost uh, income, uh, to cover the, the lost income from transport. There's £20 million allocated to the Department for, transport, or Department for Infrastructure uh, in relation to transport issues, and some was allocated for Northern Iron Water as well. Uh, I can get the member the detail of that, but I, I, I think certainly 10 million that was to do with lost income. Uh, TransLink have been projecting uh, what the cost to them of lost income is for the rest of the year, which takes well over 100 million pounds, uh, and the executive has been able, on a kind of periodic basis, to allocate money to, uh, to keep them afloat for another month and another month. Uh, but the bigger questions arise in relation to TransLink, which I think need to be looked at as well. Mr. Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I, I note that there is uh, six million pounds there for paramedic services. Can the minister give us an assurance that whilst monitoring round is often a one-off payment, that this will actually help the ambulance service going forward, given that in rural constituencies such as my own and his own, uh, many people are left for far too long to wait on ambulances because they're trapped in urban areas? Well, I hope, I hope that is the longer term outcome, obviously, uh, from a constituency interest point of view, like myself. Uh, but the, the, the generally bids are, are made in, in relation to monitoring rounds for particular pressures that the department is, is, 
is facing at this particular time. So I don't necessarily have the detail of what the pressures were that, that brought that bid for. Of course, I'm happy to support the health service generally. It's been under an enormous strain, is under an enormous strain on a continuous basis, but obviously significant additional strain as a consequence of responding to the pandemic. Uh, but uh, clearly the ambulance service is a very important part of the provision for rural health provision. Uh, we rely on it very, very much in areas we represent. Uh, but this would be for particular pressure that's in the here and now. Uh, what the health department is spent into the future, I think, would be a matter for yourselves and the health chair, maybe, and others to, to interrogate. Mr. Andrew Muir. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I uh, echo the words of other members and welcome you back. It's good to see you in your place. Um, the Belfast campus of the University of Ulster was seen to be one of the ways to be able to utilise the financial transactions capital funding, but we're now told that that's not going to happen and £25 million is going to have to be uh, replaced and actually used from, uh, from capital funding. Why is that and why aren't, aren't we able to use the financial transactions capital for this project? Well, I think they, are able, they were able to, would have been able to use the financial transactions, but they, the Department for the Economy made a bid to transfer it into capital money because it was capital money available. Uh, and I think it is to do with ensuring that the, the University of Ulster has the economic resilience and the financial resilience to carry forward that significant project and to look forward uh, to other projects that have been, been involved in. So I, I think probably perhaps some of the rationale behind that approach would be better asked for the, from the Department of the Economy, but it, it, it's not that they couldn't avail of the financial transaction capital. It was a request rather than have be given a loan through that purpose to give them a grant of, of capital, which we did. Mr. Pat Catney. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and uh, Minister. Uh, on your way home, if uh, you take the country road out towards Lisburn, there's a beautiful little bar out there. It's called Jackie Stewart. It used to be owned uh, Robin Stewart used to be owned by Jackie, and Jackie's now retired. The point I'm trying to make is there is there is there's a new owner there's a new owner there, there's a new owner in this establishment and he is spending great money and great ideas for this bar. Uh, it was first founded in 1610, and then it was the Spirit Grocers as well. But the question I want to ask the Minister is, contrary to what people say about me, I would be quite willing, Minister, to buy a pint, to step up to the bar first, if you would find the time in order to get out there. But my only get-out-of-jail card would be as long as it doesn't be contrary to the Ministerial uh, Code of Conduct. Well, I think we'll all drink to that. Minister? I think a price of a pint comes in underneath the threshold uh, for, for bribery. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I'm not aware. I generally, when I go out the road to home, I go the motorway, so I don't pass too many pubs in it. But listen, I'm aware that, uh, that particularly in the hospitality industry, people are continuing to struggle, and they're being very innovative and, and, and invest in their own money, in their own businesses. This, these are things that people have put their heart, life and soul into over many, many years. Uh, and we need to assist them in wherever we can. And as I said in response to previous questions, part of that is whatever financial assistance we give them, but it's also things like planning and licensing laws and a range of other measures uh, to make sure that we can ensure hospitality, which is a key part of our economic uh, product here, uh, is, is supported in every way we can. Thank you. No other members indicated that. Okay, uh, Mr. McAleer first. Uh, Minister, during the course, or uh, last Concordia, during the course of the Finance Minister's statement, the Deira Minister made a statement, released a written statement, and relating to the, the allocation of the £25 million agri-food market intervention scheme. Given that this was a sitting day, um, you know, perhaps it would have been appropriate to have the Minister come to the Chamber to, rela to, to um, release that statement and leave himself open for a question from Assembly members, given the, the seriousness and the huge level of public interest in this particular issue. Uh, standing orders are clear. Uh, when a minister is due to deliver an, or an oral ministerial statement, that minister shall make a written copy of that statement available to members. It will not be delivered to the media first. It should not. And uh, this has been established practice and convention in this House that ministers deliver statements to the House rather than issuing them as press release and then coming and reading them out in the House. And so I will have the Speaker's office write to the chair of the committee outlining the behaviour that's expected from executive ministers in issuing statements. I hope that satisfies the member. Point of order, Mr Buckley. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, earlier today I raised a point of order uh, with Deputy Speaker Beggs regarding Deputy First Minister Michelle O'Neill's attendance 
uh, at the funeral of Bobby Story, where we witnessed breaches of social distancing. I ask that our conduct be reviewed by the Speaker's office and referred to the Member's Code of Conduct. Further to that point of order, it has now come to my attention that the Finance Minister, Conor Murphy, was also in attendance. I would ask that the Speaker's office also rule on Mr Murphy's conduct via the Code of Conduct. This very well may be a breach of the Pledge of Office, where it states to support and to act in accordance with all decisions of the Executive Committee and Assembly. This blatant breach of COVID-19 regulations will be seen as a total insult to those many families who buried loved ones in isolation. This House must prove that no one is above the law, especially ministers who collectively brought forward such regulations. Uh, similar issues were raised with me before from in this chair about conduct of ministers. And I think it's important I will have the Speaker's office write to the member in relation to that. Um, I would say I think part of the point, points of order process is about conduct inside this chamber and dealing with conduct inside this chamber, but there are also elements of it that reflect conduct outside the chamber. So uh, if the member wishes to raise his issue in writing with the Speaker's office, I'm sure he'll be furnished with a written, supply, or a written reply. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is to return to the Health Protection Coronavirus uh, provisions. Uh, the Minister had delivered his address, and the next person to speak was the Chair of the TEO Committee, uh, Mr Colin McGrath. But I'll 